Starting point, 1979 to 1996, Hayao Miyazaki. The starting point of the greatest career in animation history. In the first two decades of his career, filmmaker Hayao Miyazaki laid the groundwork for his legendary movies, Starting Point, 1979 to 1996 is a collection of essays, interviews, and memoirs that goes back to the roots of Miyazaki's childhood, the formulation of his theories of animation, and the founding of Studio Ghibli. Before directing such acclaimed films as Spirited Away, Miyazaki was just another sal salaried animator, but one with a vision of his own. Follow him as he takes his first steps on the road to success, experiences fr uh, frustrations with the manga and animation industries that often suffocate creativity, and realize the importance of bringing the childhood dreams of the world to life. Starting point 1979 to 1996 is not just a chronicle of the life of a man whose own dreams have come true, it is a tribute to the power of the moving image. Forward. The Cat Bus and Pure Cinematic Magic. John Lasseter talks about Hayao Miyazaki. I first met Hayao Miyazaki-san about 20 years ago in Los Angeles. He has just completed Lupin III, the castle of Cagliostro. I didn't have the opportunity to see the whole movie. I just saw a small reel of clips, but from the little I did see, I was taken with the characters. I was also impressed with the energy and cleverness of the animation. I still think it contains one of the best car chases ever seen on film. The imagination invested in the movie really inspired me. I could tell someone who knew and loved animation had made it. The castle of Cagliostro is so much more than taking a live action film and making it animation. It took the medium and really used it to its fullest potential. That's what always inspired me about every Miyazaki-san film I've seen. It's like, wow, this is someone who really loves animation as much as I do. That totally excites me. I remember t taking the clips to Walt Disney Studio and showing them to various people. This was probably back in the early 1980s. I had some friends on the organizing committee of the Los Angeles International Film Exposition, and we worked together to get Castle of Cal uh, Cagliostro shown at the Film Ex which is a predecessor of the American Film Institute's International Film Festival in L.A. I was thrilled to finally see it on the big screen with a live audience. People just loved it. I next met Miyazaki-san during my first trip to Tokyo in 1987, and I will never forget my, that experience. I was there to give a lecture at Nikograph International a Japanese computer animation and computer graphics conference. One of the people I met at the conference used to work with Miyazaki-san and he arranged a visit for me. After a long train ride, we finally arrived at Miyazaki-san's work studio. I was struck by all the beautiful background paintings hanging on the walls and had to, a had to ask him what movie was he currently working on. There was an enig enigmatic smile on his face as he showed me an animation cell of a cat bus. Of course, it was from my neighbor Totoro. I was so amazed just by that one single drawing of the cat bus. It was thrilling to see the imagination at work. A year later, we finally got a chance to see the final pro finished product. It was so incredible. How fortunate for us to have visited Miyazaki-san's studio 
while he was making such a wonderful film. Now, Totoro is an important part of my life. I brought home a Jap Japanese laser disc ver a Japanese laser disc version of the movie that my five sons grew up watching. Later, it was released in an English version for the U.S. And of course, we watched that too. My sons actually prefer the Japanese version. The characters are so alive. The character of Mei, for example, is just one of our favorites. I have used scenes from Totoro as teaching tools while giving lectures to Pixar animators. To me, one of the basic elements in defining the personality of an animated character is to show the same action performed by two separate characters. No one does the same thing in the same way. No one. By using this technique, the characters really take on a personality of their own. There is one scene in Totoro where Mei and her older sister, Satsuki, are exploring their new house. Satsuki is running around and opening random doors. Then Mei comes in and does the same thing, but she does it like a young child. This scene tells the audience that Mei is the younger of the two girls. Nothing else needs to be said. It's so clear. There are two different characters, two different ages, doing the same thing but in completely different ways. I've always admired that particular scene, both for its simplicity and for the believability of the characters it portrays. I could go on and on. I continually find inspiration in Miyazaki-san's work. In Laputa, released in the U.S. as Castle in the Sky, there is a scene that gives me chills every time I watch it. It's the rescue sequence. Shita is saved from the robot, and you see the fort exploding. When Shita jumps and is ultimately rescued, it is amazing. It's one of the greatest rescue scenes ever put on film, and I love it. I've studied that scene frame by frame. In A Bug's Life, the character Flick assembles all the bugs together in an attempt to save a little ant named Dot. For reference, we sat down and studied the rescue scene in Castle in the Sky very carefully. We didn't copy it, but we tried to pick the scene apart to identify why it worked so well. I know what's going to happen, of course. She gets rescued. I know that, but every time I see it, I get the chills. It inspired us. People tell us how much they enjoyed that particular scene in A Bug's Life, and it holds a great debt of gratitude toward the castle in the sky. There's something that Miyazaki-san does better than anybody else in the animation industry. He's great at giving things a sense of scale. It's a hard thing to do, especially in animation. With animation, you achieve scale, weight, and size purely through movement. You get that by seeing how things move and how things relate to each other. In all of his films, he gives us an incredible sense of scale. Castle in the Sky, especially, is a masterpiece in this way. Take another look at those flying ships. There is no question they're huge. And you can just tell they weigh an enormous amount, too. I mean, look at them. You can feel their weight. It's not just perspective. It's movement, it's size, it's weight. It, it really is amazing. Another thing that's very important in filmmaking, something we pay strict attention to at Pixar, is pacing. Pacing is the timing of shot after shot after shot after shot. I'm always thinking about the movies being made in Hollywood. They all have a tendency to make things extremely fast paced. I don't know why this is. Maybe it's the influence of video games or music videos or the result of our fast moving society in general. Whatever it is, I think directors, editors, and studio studios feel compelled to hurry the action along at a breakneck speed. There's a term that a certain studio executive used when he sensed the movie was starting to slow down. He'd say, I'm going for popcorn. He felt that unless a movie raced nonstop to its conclusion, an audience would inevitably lose interest. I totally disagree with him. Things don't need to be faster all the time. That's one of the ways Miyazaki-san's films, especially My Neighbor Totoro, have inspired me. His movies have balance, both fast and slow movement. You can even go back to Castle of uh, Cagliostro and see it. That car chase up the hill is still one of my favorite scenes. 
but just before the chase, Lupin's car gets a flat tire and swerves to the side of the road. He climbs up on the roof and just sits there looking up at the sky. The clouds are going by, the wind is blowing, we're showing a field of grass. And then you hear this key sound. Miyazaki-san allows Lupin to react with a what was that look before a car soars past him, roars past, past him. It's set up, it sets up the chase so beautifully because of the quiet moment right before. That's pacing. One of the greatest scenes in all of Miyazaki-san's films is the one where the, when the cat bus first appears in Totoro. It's just pure cinematic magic. To me, what makes it so special is the pacing of it. It's something you don't normally see in a film. The bus arrives at the bus stop, but the father is not on it. The kids then have to wait in the rain. You feel the waiting. And it's not tedious. It's beautiful. May is getting sleepy, and believe me, being a father, I know how kids get bored and sleepy. So Satsuki puts her... Uh, on her back under the umbrella and waiting continues and then Totoro arrives and it's just so special by the time the cat bus arrives it's like well I couldn't believe what I was looking at I remember the first time I saw it I had the same expression on my face as May and her sister it really is a great scene I confess that sometimes I look at my own films and I think that we may have rushed certain moments Making these movies takes years and years, and you get used to what you see. There's a tendency to accept the familiar, and therefore things appear to be going slower than they actually are. What I've learned from watching Miyazaki-san's films, and I think Toy Story 2 is a good example of this, is that now that I have confidence to slow down the action a little bit, there's, this, there's a scene in Toy Story 2 where Woody has just heard Jesse's backstory. He finds out that she was loved by a child and then, and then discarded when that child grew up. I am very proud of the way we scripted Woody's reaction to this sad story. We deliberately took our time with it. Uh, Jesse tells Woody to go, and Woody silently climbs down from the window ledge. There is not much going on. He slowly walks over to the air vent in the wall, unscrews it, and opens it up. There's no music, no dialogue, just the sound of the footsteps, his footsteps. I believe there are certain emotions that need time to sink in with the audience. This was one of them. I learned this trick from watching all of Hayao Miyazaki's films. That scene is very much inspired by the pacing I learned from him. In the first Toy Story movie, we made some edits that I now regret. We were getting input from the studio and they said we needed to increase the tempo in certain areas. Since it was our first movie, we figured the studio guys knew what they were talking about, so we made some cuts per their recommendations. I look back now at the, that movie, and I wish I had some of the original pacing back. But we live and learn. With A Bug's Life, and especially in Toy Story 2, we became much more confident in what we wanted to do. We knew Toy Story, we knew exactly what sort of pacing worked best for us. The co-director on the Toy Story 2 movie was Lee Un Un Unkrich. He was also the editor for all of our films. I turned Lee on to Miyazaki-san's films, and we've had many discussions about how Miyazaki-san is a master of pacing. There are certain moments in a film you cannot rush through. It's important to allow the audience to reflect on what's happening on the screen. I remember reading reviews on Toy Story 2 when it was first released. Many critics mentioned that it had an emotional depth lacking in most animated films. In fact, they were surprised to discover that a cartoon could deliver such depth. I'm very proud of that. <clears throat> most of the critics didn't specifically mention the movie's pacing. But to me, that was the key to, the, to Toy Story's success. You need that component to reflect pathos, sadness, all those heartfelt emotions. Like I've said before, you just can't rush those things. From the interview in Ghibli, Studio Ghibli, May 2005.
John Lasseter is an Academy Award-winning animator and director and is currently the CCO of Walt Disney and Pixar Animation Studios. As a director, his films include Toy Story, A Bug's Life, Toy Story 2, and Cars. With Pixar, he was the executive producer for Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, and The Incredibles. On creating animation. <clears throat> Nostalgia for a Lost World. This was uh, an article from Animation Monthly, picture book special, in March 1979. What animation is to me? If I were asked to give my view, in a nutshell, of what animation is, I would say it is whatever I want to create. The world of animation is wide, and it includes not only animated series for television, but also commercials, experimental films, and theatrical features. But no matter what others may say, if it isn't something I really want to work on, it isn't animation to me. I'm talking about a very personal view of animation here, of course, and when it comes to my work, there are also obviously times when I have to compromise. In fact, there are times when I really have to struggle and I suffer quite a bit in the process. In that regard, I feel particularly lucky that Future Boy Conan, a series I first worked on years ago, was not only something I wanted to create, but also work that I greatly enjoyed. In other words, I'm talking about doing something with animation that can't be done with manga magazines, children's literature, or even live action films. I'm talking about building a truly unique imaginary world, tossing in characters I like, and then creating a complete drama using them. Simply put, this is what animation is to me. Wanting one's own world. Animation or anime has become extremely popular among those we call mid-teens, and especially among middle school students. And why th is this? I think I have a pretty good idea or at least understand the background behind the phenomenon. Personally, I was never more passionate about manga than when preparing for my college entrance exams. It's a period of life when young people appear to have a great deal of freedom, but are in many ways actually very repressed. Just when they find themselves powerfully attracted to members of the opposite sex, they have to really crack the books. To escape from this depressing situation, they often find themselves wishing they could live in a world of their own. A world they can say is truly theirs. A world unknown even to their parents. To young people, anime is something they can incorporate into this private world. I often refer to this feeling as one of yearning for a lost world. It's a sense that although you may currently be living in a world of constraints, if you were free from those constraints, you would be able to do all sorts of things. And it's this feeling, I believe, that makes mid-teens so passionate about anime. The word nostalgia comes to mind. Adults fondly recall something from their childhood, often speak of nostalgia. But even three, four, and five-year-olds feel a similar sentiment. It's something that all of us regard, regardless of age, actually experience. And as we get older, the breadth or depth of our nostalgia definitely increases. I believe, in fact, that nostalgia is one of the fundamental starting points for most people involved in creating animation. Human history exists in a continuum, continuum encompassing both the past and the future. But the moment someone is born into the present instant, into 1978, he or she has already lost certain opportunities or possibilities, including the chance to be born in other ages. Yet we can still enjoy ourselves in different fantasy worlds. And this yearning for other lost possibilities may also be a major motivator for those of us in the industry. Most people feel unfulfilled by something in their lives, even if they don't consider themselves to be living in a particularly unhappy environment. 
It may even be one reason so many Japanese in their mid-teens love to read Anne Frank, The Diary of a Young Girl. In a sense, they may actually envy the situation described in the book. They may wish that they too could experience a life like that of Anne Frank, to live to the fullest amid such tension, in such an extreme environment. Of course, they would feel revulsion if they were if there were any real chance of them actually being placed in such a horrific situation. What I'm saying here is that when young people feel attracted to the heroes of a tragedy, whether in animation or other media, a type of narcissism is really involved. This attraction they feel is a surrogate emotion for something they have lost. From personal experience, I can say that I first fell in love with animation when I saw Haku Jaden, The Tale of the White Serpent the animated feature produced by Toy Animation in 1958. I can still remember the pangs of emotion I felt at the sight of the incredibly beautiful young female character, Bai Niang, and how I went to see the film over and over as a result. It was like being in love, and Bai Niang became a surrogate girlfriend for me at a time when I had none. It is in this sense that I think we can achieve a type of satisfaction by substituting something for the unfulfilled portion of our lives. The something can be a movie, music, or a novel, and it can include animation. Those in their mid-teens who are so passionate about anime today will probably go on to graduate from it. They will likely seek another surrogate something in their lives even if they continue to seek it in anime. As they age, the ways in which they seek it will probably change. It is, I suspect, the normal pattern of things. If I were to create it. I was hooked when I first saw Haku Jaden, and I wound up choosing to become an animator because of it. In the more than 15 years since then, I've had one constant theme in my work to watch good animation, and then to make something that surpasses it. I saw Haku Jaden over and over again, but eventually I came to believe that the film was a sham. There is too great a focus on the tragic connection between the young male protagonist, Shuzen, and the beautiful white girl, by, by Niang. As a result, the other characters aren't depicted in a very attractive light at all, because of this, while I dearly loved Haku Jaden, I was increasingly, increasingly plagued by the doubts about it, and I began instead to excitedly imagine how, if I were to have created it, I would have done this or that differently. Today, I rarely watch any animation that amazes me or makes my heart uh, pound with excitement. I'd of course love to see works that do even if only once a year. For most people, and not just professionals like myself, it's probably the way real animation is supposed to be. After all, but creating animation of that caliber requires a huge amount of concentration. Even when drawing the individual illustrations and the animated film won't come to life unless the animators themselves pour their hearts and souls into their work. In reality, we rarely have the luxury of doing that. And even if we do throw ourselves into our work in this industry, we can never expect to never expect commensurate rewards or treatment. As a result, the sort of work I am describing cannot be created without the help of people who are truly willing to go hungry. I'm not talking about people who make experimental animation, but something completely different. I'm talking about those who create animation designed for a wide audience that includes children. The type of animation that cannot be made by a single individual. Commercial animation, animation almost by definition requires group effort. Even if the animated images ultimately, ultimately move as a result of the efforts of each individual of the group, the final product can never be from one person alone. It must belong to everyone, as well as to each individual. 
For us, the ultimate dream is to create works this way and have as many people as possible view them. At the core, there must be a sense of realism. In Japan today, animated TV shows filled with all kinds of fancy robot-like mechanical creations are all the rage. I've certainly drawn lots of mecha or mechanical things myself, but the general theme of current popu popular shows seems to be that the protagonist jumps in a giant machine he couldn't possibly have created on his own, battles the enemy in it, and then boasts about winning. I frankly hate these kinds of shows. I don't care what types of robots are featured. For me, in a truly successful mecha show, the protagonist should struggle to build his own machine, he should fix it when it breaks down, and he should have to operate it himself. In modern society, humans have become slaves to machines so much so that machines currently hold the keys to our collective fate. But that is the real world. In the world of anime, by contrast, humans control and operate the machines. Yet despite the fact that anime has been granted the special freedom to show things this way, most works really don't take advantage of this. Everyone is attracted to power and strength. This was true even in ancient Japanese tales in which the superheroes such as Kurama Tengu appeared. People were able to identify with these heroes and to enjoy imagining themselves as superheroes. But today's supermen also have machines and technology at their disposal. And even if only one person operates a specific machine, that machine presumably required multiple designers and mechanics to reach the point of being operational. In the world of fiction, I believe that we have to depict the, this background to give the machines an air of reality. I despise shows that fail to do so. As a result, I don't watch your typical anime action anime, anime films. And it's also the reason why, when I worked on Future Boy Conan, I did not try to make animation, as we usually think of it, but a manga or a cartoon film. Anime may, may depict fictional worlds, but I nonetheless, nonetheless believe that at its core it must have a certain realism. Even if the world depicted is a lie, the trick is to make it seem as real as possible. Stated another way, the animator must fabricate a lie that seems so real to the viewers they will think the world depicted might actually possibly exist. For example, say one makes an animated film depicting the world of a bug from the viewpoint of the bug. Such a film shouldn't show the world from the perspective of a human using a magnifying glass, but a world where each blade of grass becomes a giant tree where the ground is not flat but bumpy and rough, and where water, whether in the form of rain or droplets, has a completely different character than we humans normally think of it as having. In its depicting, it's in depicting the world this way that the story becomes interesting and starts to, starts to seem real. In my view, this is one of the hallmarks in animation in general, and one of its most wonderful qualities gags and laughter. Let me next comment on gags. Most gags make fun of human stupidity, but I think laughing at other people's foibles actually represents something far more base and vicious than a gag. So what do I consider a real gag? Well, it's when someone tries his or, ha or her absolute best to do something, and for some unexpected reason, they lose focus and does something totally out of character or outside of the normal routine. It might be, for example, when a beautiful, gentle, gentle, proper princess attempts to save her lover from falling into the hands of bandits by kicking them. This doesn't ruin our impression of the princess, but it makes her suddenly come alive, makes her seem truly human. Gag characters are often used in animation. These are the fall guys. The characters that always screw up, slip up, or fall down. I really dislike them. The way I see it, there are many different types of humor in the world, and some humor can't easily be defined. Characters like Matthew and Anna Green Gables, for example, are very, very taciturn, but truly fascinating. 
It is when we sense the humanity of such characters that we begin to laugh. Before speaking about the techniques of animation, having said all this, if someone were to ask me, the most important thing is when creating a new animated work. My answer would be that you first have to know what you want to say with it. In other words, you have to have a theme. Surprisingly, perhaps, people sometimes overlook the basic fact of filmmaking and overemphasize technique instead. There are innumerable examples of people making films with a very high level of technique, but only a very fuzzy idea of what they really want to say. And after watching their films, viewers are usually completely befuddled. And yet when people who know what they want to say make films with a low level of technique, we still greatly appreciate the films because there is really something to them. So with that, for young people who are now dreaming of someday becoming animators, let me wrap up my thoughts. When young, nearly all of us want to be taken seriously, as soon as possible. Perhaps because of this we tend to overemphasize technique. In fact, many of those who have not yet taken the plunge into the professional world of animation tend to speak endlessly about animation techniques or concentrate on gaining as much knowledge as possible about the technical aspects of certain scenes. In reality, however, once you enter the in this, this industry, the techniques required to make animation can be mastered very quickly. Sometimes high school students and others ask me whether they should go first, to, first go to college or start working as animators right away. When asked, I respond as follows. It doesn't matter. So just go to college, go to college, and while you're enjoying four years of student life, study art if you really want to. I give, you people, I give young people this advice because jumping into the industry four years early isn't going to help them become full animators any faster. Once you're in the industry, you'll be overwhelmed with work and you won't have any time to study or learn for yourself. One of the things about drawing is that if you put in serious effort, you will become good at it, at least to a certain extent. That's all the more reason to study a variety of things that interest you while you have time, before you enter the professional world, in order to develop and solidify such fundamentals as your own viewpoint and way of thinking. If you don't do this, your life will be treated as just another disposable product. In the animation business, most people spend a long time working at the bottom of the organizational ladder. You usually have to endure a lengthy apprenticeship period, waiting patiently for the chance to someday demonstrate what you can do. But the opportunity to demonstrate what you can do only comes along once in a while. So unless you are extraordinarily lucky, you'll probably never make it. To endure something is obviously exhausting and agonizing. But at the same time, you must also continue to hold what you regard as important, close to your heart, and to nurture it. Should you ever relinquish what, you're tr what you truly hold dear, the only path left to you will be that of a pencil pusher, the type of animator whose sense of self-worth is determined by the numerical amount of his earnings, or who cycles between joy and despair over the high and low ratings the, uh, his work receives. It is all well and good to love animation, but as always, I counsel people, it is best not to think of entering the business lightly. Animation is still a very new field, and there are only a few works in existence that we can really call classics. But it is essential to watch as many of these classics as possible, and it is also essential to be interested in subjects that have traditions going back hundreds of years, and to broaden your own knowledge in exerting yourself toward the end, this end, you will find that you develop something truly all of your own. All your own. Now is the time to really study. From the outside, creating animation probably seems very glamorous and rewarding. And it is true that there are some glamorous aspects to this work. And also that I find it rewarding, 
but the glamorous parts represent only a tiny fraction of the whole. Most of the work we do, what people don't see, is actually very down to earth. Quite a few of today's younger animators plunge directly into this line of work because they were fans. But if I were to ask them to draw a picture of what they think a Chaika, which is a flying boat in Future Boy Conan, would look like in flight, they would only be able to imagine what they had previously seen on past TV anime shows, and I wouldn't be able to use their work as a result. To draw a Chaika flying in a truly original fashion, you would need to have read at least one book on the history of flying, and then be able to use your imagination to augment what you have read. In delving into books on the history of airplanes, you would encounter the, the name of Igor Sikorsky. He is a man who in 1913 built the world's first four-engine biplane and flew it in the skies over Russia. Later on, the immigrated, then Im he immigrated to the United States, and in 1941, he invented the first single main rotor helicopter. When Sikorsky flew his four-engine plane over Russia, he is known for having dined on board, and then when an engine failed, for grabbing onto one of the struts supporting the wings and standing up out of the cockpit. With the full blast of the wind in his face, he personally and anxiously checked the condition of the engines. I personally think Sikorsky, Sikorsky symbolizes the way men really fly, and it is from this image of someone simply yearning to fly that a good illustration emerges. And it does not come from imitating something seen long ago on an animated TV series from a plastic model kit, or even from the experience of having flown in one of today's hermetically sealed passenger airplanes. Passenger planes. Once involved in the business of creating animation, the truth of the matter is that you wind up working on project after project and rarely have time to read, study, or come up with great ideas. And then the question invariably arises, why am I creating animation? What am I doing this for? Is it just to make a living? I know I'm repeating myself here, but to avoid this trap, my advice to you all is to study. Now back to your regularly scheduled program.